Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop and today we're making a timber framed ping pong table. <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. <laughs> We're going to be making this beastly thing out of red oak. I know, red oak, right? Yes, but this is actually, um, red oak is incredibly strong, and not to mention it's far more affordable. And with how much I'm going to need from this, um, it's going to be a lot. There's about 60 board feet into this thing. And I need to figure out where all these pieces are going to come out. There are going to be two long stretchers that run the whole length of the board, and then two short stretchers. And then there's going to be eight of the diagonals and four legs, and then one center stretcher that goes across and that will actually hold the net. Uh, so it's, it's a relatively simple construction. It's just very very big and beefy. And so I'm going to start breaking this down. And it's very important to label everything right off the bat so you're not getting more of one and you're not getting short. And it, just making sure there is a mark on every board so you know what every piece is and where it goes in the project. I'm going to be breaking this down. You'll see that I'm going to be using a hard point uh, a cheap saw. And I, I like, I've really gotten into using those for breaking down where I don't care about the quality of the cut. I just want to cut it quickly and get it sliced. Uh, it works out very well. I used to use a buck saw, but I, I've now switched over to using hard point saws. I'm going to joint one edge on all of these, and then we can start ripping them down. Uh, because these are relatively thick, uh, I find it much faster to rip them down um, in the, the vise and, and to do it with the handsaw and or frame saw. Um, I, I like using the handsaw as it's a little faster and easier to work, uh, but the frame saw, you can get the whole body into it and you can really go to town on this, and they, they cut relatively quickly. But uh, two or three boards into this, it's, I start thinking, you know, I wonder, what, 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 wish I had a good table saw. <laughs> this one in particular, I was a little bit off, and so we had to come in and split it off. Thankfully, I stayed a little ways in my left line, so I had some work to, uh, to, uh, to bring it back. Then we can come back in and get rid of all of these saw cuts and get a nice clean surface that is parallel to the first one we had. And with that, we've got the board that's relatively close. Um, these are all slightly larger in every dimension, but in most of these cases, they really don't matter. This one is going to end up being one of the diagonals, and so I'm going to put my miter square on here and mark the shoulder, and then I'm going to come in with another square, put it on there, and mark again, and this will be the length of the tenon out from it, because there'll be a tenon on the end of this 45. Um, I ended up originally thinking I'd do one inch, and then I ended up remarking them uh, and doing them at an uh, inch and a half, because uh, I need a little more meat in there so that when I put a pin through, it, uh, it will go well. I'm going to then cut down the 45, and this is actually cutting on the end of the tenon um, rather than on the uh, uh, on the shoulder because we want to make sure we're cutting it long enough so we can put a tenon on the end. And then we can turn it around and do the same cut on the other end. Um, I, I kind of laid these out a little ahead of time and figured out how big do I want them to be and just eyeballed the size. They come about halfway down the leg um, and then the same amount out on the stretcher. And they will be flush with the front edge of the leg and flush with the front edge of the stretcher. Uh, and the whole leg and stretcher assembly will be inset one inch uh, from the tabletop. So the tabletop will actually overhang this whole structure by one inch. And then we can start cutting the, the tenon. I'm going to use it to, to mark out with a, uh, uh, a mortise engage so that I have it set up to go off of the reference face on all of these. And then we can rip it down. Uh, I'm using my tenon saw, which is normally pretty good, but these are some pretty big tenons. Uh, for that, I like to bring in my, my continental frame saw. Uh, this actually works really well and very efficient because they're big rip teeth and it marches through it very well. So anytime I'm doing a large tenon, um, I usually bring that out. It goes pretty quickly, as long as you keep it tight. Um, and I didn't keep it tight, and it was bowing out in the middle. Um, so I needed to come back and clean those out. And I learned my lesson, and later on I tightened it down more. Uh, with bow saws and frame saws, you really got to get them tight. And the, the tighter you get them, the better. You can see how this one, it was um, bowing out big time inside. And when we break it off, you'll see the saw is connecting here, it's connecting there, uh, but it's not coming out, and that's because there's actually a big chunk um, underneath that is, um, well, the, the saw was bowing. I was right on my line on the front and the back, but uh, not in between. So we can come into the chisel, knock out this piece, and see, oh yeah, there's my problem. So it's one of those things you live and learn, and then you tighten up the saw blade. I want to make sure these cheeks are, are nice and tight, so I can come in with the rabbit plane. I don't use this very often, but every now and then it, it's great for rabbits and, and shoulders. Um, sometimes I'll come in with a router plane, but uh, for really big tenons like this, uh, that's definitely the way to go. Now we need to work on the legs. We ripped up a bunch of these, and they're just not big enough and beefy enough. So I'm going to take two of these and laminate them together. So we have, uh, this is, ends up being three and a half inches by three and a half inches. 
clamp them down, squeeze them, and go to town. Uh, I have been using epoxy more and more. I, I've just gotten so much more reliability out of it. Um, and I find that it, it goes much simpler, especially for big glue-ups like this. Uh, the inside takes forever to fully dry with normal PVAs, and it can actually sometimes be a week or more until they get fully uh, dry on the inside, uh, just because there's not enough oxygen movement. Uh, but with epoxy, it cures rather than dries. And so for big things like this, epoxy is a, a huge value in this. So let's go back over here to uh, this, and you can see that, oh, no, I blew past the shoulder. Uh, yeah, there's be a little gap there, but oh, well. We're going to clean this up, and uh, one of the things I love about these big joints is that if there is a little gap, then, you know, it's, it's not as big of a problem. It's something that um, it works, but it, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. It's a great opportunity to set aside the perfectionism. Once the epoxy is cured, we can come back in and plane it off and smooth it down and get this edge 90 degrees to the reference face. And then we can do the same thing on the other side and clean them up and then come in at the smoothing plane and make them all nice and pretty. And then we can make sure we uh, ding them up because you know that, that's what happens. Once you make a board really nice and pretty, that's when you accidentally drop it, especially with something big like this. <laughs> we wanna actually cut this leg down to size. And so I'm gonna be marking around the board on one end cut it off and then measure down the the length and, and cut it precisely to the the length it needs to be uh, which for a ping pong table is actually pretty short it's only uh, it's a little over two feet off of the ground um, so it feels really really short and it seems odd until you play on it and you realize oh yeah that's actually about the, the height it should be i can come in with the plane and smooth off the ends um, eventually i will be putting a large chamfer on the bottom of this uh, as well as i will be having a chamfer at every joint i'm um, just adding that little bit extra look to it I'm going to be spending a lot of time chamfering these um, in the future. And then, of course, we're going to label everything. Now let's move on to the stretcher. In this case, I'm going to be doing one of the short stretchers that will go across the end of the table where you play. I'll go back to the mortise and gauge and have it set up as I did before, and we're going to label that out. Uh, this is going to have a shoulder on all four sides, and hey, this one's kind of nice. It's just like a standard tenon, just bigger rather than being on the 45. Uh, and uh, it seems really nice until you go and cut down the cheeks. And then you realize that I'm working on a board that's almost as long as I am tall. So it means I can't have it vertical like I'd normally want. It means it has to be an angle. And then when you start working on the long ones that are nine foot long, uh, then it has to be an even more of an angle. And I, it's it was a bit of a difficulty working on this way up here almost at eye level. Um, but with some time and some patience, it actually works out pretty well. And yeah, for this one, it was shallow enough. I just decided to use the, the tenon saw all the way down. Um, I, I think I ended up going with the, the bow saw for most of them. Uh, but for the one of the videos, the tenon saw works really well. I could come in with a chisel and chop them down, um, but I, I really like sawing them out and having these blocks. I mean, I throw away the blocks or put them in the burn pile. They're not really worth saving, but uh, it is enjoyable when they just pop off like that. Then we can come in, clean it out, uh, smooth it down, and make it ready. Want to make sure that this is square and flat, and if you use a, uh, uh, a chisel edge to check all the way along, make sure that it is exactly the way it should be. Some people like to come in with a router plane, uh, but for big ones like this, um, I generally prefer to do it with a chisel and plane. Now that we have all of the tenons cut, now we need to come back and cut all of the mortises. Big, heavy, honking mortises. And yes, that means the boring work. Um, when I'm using the big ones, I, I do end up bringing in the demon possessed drill just because I've got to cut a lot of them. And uh, yeah, <laughs> when you got to cut a lot of these, this goes very, very well um, and very efficiently. Um, but yeah, of course, for the camera, I have to bring out this and, and show that you can do it with a brace, but I'm not even that crazy, so don't don't worry about it too much. <laughs> now that we've uh, gotten out most of the material, we want to actually chisel this out. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to use my uh, my foot powered mortiser. Um, unfortunately, I don't have um, a chisel wide enough at the moment. I have ordered them, um, so once I move into the new house, um, I will have larger chisels. Um, but this was kind of fun to to set up and play through and thinking. Uh, and it's just a, a really cool tool. Once you actually get it dialed in, it goes really, really quickly. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to doing the rest of the mortises uh, when I get to the new shop because you can set it in here and with the foot on there, once it's in place, you just go crunk and it's all the way down. And it's it's kind of cool. Uh, and it is actually rather enjoyable. Um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to spending more time with this thing, especially once you get it set up, it goes all the way down. Oh yeah, gotta set that, that stop so it doesn't keep pulling back up. Uh, it is kind of like a power tool in that there is a lot of setup. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to wait on this one 
and uh, wait until I got the the uh, bit that was the correct size and would go all the way across. Uh, it is coming in the mail, but uh, is not here yet. So I finished them up in the uh, uh, in the vise with a standard chisel because uh, this was actually a little bit faster than doing it with a foot powered mortiser um, because the, the, the just left a little bit more uh, material that needed to be removed than uh, than I'd want to, especially with the time of having to move it several times with a smaller bit. Once we get those mortises in place, then I can line up the uh, the diagonal on here and figure out where the mortises need to go into the stretcher and the leg for that. So we're going to clamp this all in place, make sure that it's square, then I'm going to set this on here, and I'm going to mark the edges of where the tenons intersect with the stretcher and the leg, have it all in place, and then transfer those lines across the faces. And then with that in place, I can bring over the mortising gauge and make it set up to exactly uh, what the, the tenons are. Uh, now, some people like to make the mortises first and then the tenons second. Um, the idea being that it's easier to adjust the tenon. And yes, it is easier to adjust the tenon, but I find it much easier to mark the mortise from the tenon and almost impossible to mark the tenon from the mortise. Um, so I cut the tenon first and then mark out the mortise, and then suck all the dust back into the block. <laughs> now, I, I, I still adjust the tenon, because there's no reason not to. Um, so I don't understand exactly why someone would want to do the mortise first when it's just plain and simple and easier to do the tenon first. Um, but different people like different things. So we can get this in here, make sure it wiggles down in, and you can see that it's tight on the other side and loose on one side, and that means I need more work on the other side. And so a lot of it's just going back and forth and seeing what needs to be adjusted. And in this case, it needs to be the tenon. And so I put it in the vise and adjust it down, and hey, look, that works. And then I can cut the mortise in the leg. And then we can put the leg on here and see how does that fit. Um, and it's kind of one of these back and forth things. And then once you get all this done, you realize, oh, wait, I've got to do this seven more times. Uh, because there are four corners and uh, two diagonals on each corner, eight total. Um, yeah, this is going to be a lot of work. But it's a surprisingly fun work, uh, especially once you really get into it and you get things set up. Uh, it's kind of one of these things you can zone out and just go to town on it. Really big joinery does take a lot of time, uh, but it's very rewarding, especially when the pieces kind of slide in. They can be a little bit more sloppy than normal, and that's that's okay. Sometimes I like to have them, so I have to pound them in, and sometimes I like them, so they just slide in. And all of these joints will be pinned in place, uh, so we'll be doing a draw bore on all of them, and so there will be plenty of strength in this. But eventually, it just gets to the point where you wiggle it down in and, hey, look, we have one corner done. Or one half of one corner done. Wow, I've got a lot more work to do on this thing. Um, but when I do, this is going to be a really heavy, beefy one table. So, yeah, there you have it. Lots of fun. So, <laughs> there you have it. This thing is going to be an absolute beast, but there's this little story behind this because uh, Camp Joy, a place where my, my kids go to camp, uh, the, the camp director showed me the ping pong table, and it's a, it's a fold-up ping pong table. And he said, you know, there really isn't any solid ping pong table you can buy, and all the fold-up ones end up breaking every so often because you have a thousand teens in camp. So I said, well, I could make one. I'm making one that won't break. So yes, this is all be uh, joined together. And this is actually the short end of the ping pong table. I wanted to get one joint together and I'm gonna go and do the rest of them off camera. Um, all of these are going to be pinned and pegged. Uh, it will be with able to stand the entire camp on top of this. Um, I might have to see if the floor can hold it up. So <laughs> this should be a really interesting one. I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get the second half of this out uh, because we're going to be moving here soon. Um, so stay tuned. The second half of this will happen in the new shop. So we're going to have some fun with that. If you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, or things you'd like to see me do, let me know those down in the comments down below. I do read through all those and answer as many of those as I can get to. Thank you. Honestly, um, those comments really help out the channel. And there's a bunch of people who just put comment down below, down below. It means a lot. It really does. Uh, but uh, there's the people over here, though. Those are, those are really cool people. Those are some of the patrons on Patreon. And between patrons and members and, and people who click the thank you button down below, you guys support this channel. You allow me to do interesting and weird things like a timber-framed ping-pong table. Who would have thought? Let's go have some fun with that. So if you want to find out more about you know what to do, links down below. I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day.
when the air raid sirens go off, I know where I'm going to be hiding. <laughs> yeah, duck and cover.